You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Welcome, everyone. This is the Scaling Up Services podcast. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. And today, we're speaking with Elaine Pohlfeld. Elaine is the author of The Million Dollar One-Person Business, and I'm really excited to have Elaine on here. And actually, I, to let people know, I know Elaine actually through – so a lot of the listeners here are uh, know the Gazelles community and know uh, Vern Harnish. Elaine has worked with Vern actually um, a lot previously, so that's how actually I, I met Elaine, and Elaine has come speak at some of our EO events, our EO Accelerator events. And so I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you on the podcast and talk a little bit more about, about your book and about the work that you've done writing and, and covering entrepreneurs. So welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Bruce. It's great to be here. <laughs> so why don't we start, actually, why don't we just start having you just give a little bit of your background and kind of lead us up to how, how you kind of stumbled upon the topic for the book, kind of writing the book, what you've kind of discovered, and then uh, we can talk a little bit about how... Uh, what you've learned applies to services business and people that are in services businesses looking to grow them? Sure. Well, I'm a journalist who specializes in entrepreneurship and careers. I was a senior editor at Fortune Small Business Magazine for eight years, and I went freelance about 10 years ago. So I'm sort of an entrepreneur too. (laughs) And I write for a lot of different publications about the topic of entrepreneurship written for CNBC, Inc., Money, Fortune, and many others for the Economist Intelligence Unit. And I stumbled across the topic for this book when writing my Forbes blog. Uh, Like a lot of writers, I often wait until the last minute for inspiration. And it was around the 30th of the month, one month, I had one more blog post to go. And I started Googling around for ideas and I came across US Census Bureau statistics on non-employer businesses. And those are businesses that have no employees other than the owner. They could be a one-person business, they could be a partnership, they could be a few partners, basically no W-2s. And what I noticed was was a growing number that were breaking one million, especially in the one to two point four nine million dollar category. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting because I know a lot of one person businesses, and I'm sure you do too, Bruce in the accelerator, that aren't there at that million dollar mark. And I wondered, what are they doing? So yeah. I started looking at the NAICS codes, the um, industry categories, mm-hmm. and found there were a certain number in retail, a certain number in manufacturing, professional services, et cetera. So I wrote a blog post about that. People started writing to me and saying, I need to start a million dollar one person business. What are they doing exactly? I don't want to just know about whether they're in retail, like what are they selling? You know, <laughs> are they online? And so I wrote another post. I couldn't find out exactly who they were from the Census Bureau because they protect people's anonymity. And I think we all like it that way. We wouldn't want our personal census survey shared with the world. Yes. <laughs> so I wrote readers and I said, if you're one of these businesses, people are intensely curious, please tell me, what are you doing? We'd love to tell your story. So they started writing to me. And I had about five stories and put them all in a blog post and it went completely viral, like nothing I'd ever written. It has over 300,000 page views. And I had my wow. phone on the table. It was almost like it was leaping off the <laughs> table with all the messages. <laughs> literally, literally blowing up your phone. <laughs> it, it was really wild. But I thought, wow, people were really, really interested in this. And I think it's because it is so hard to make it in a one person business. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, their only commodity is their time, really, especially in professional services firms. So they don't know how to grow revenue past a certain point, and they'll often get to a decent level, 250000 300000 but they can't like, go beyond that. And they don't have the cash flow to hire employees and pay for health insurance for them and that sort of thing. So then they kind of stay in one place for years and years. But I think that's why it touched the nerve and it led to sort of a mini franchise where every time I found one of these businesses, I would profile them. And I have to say, out of, there are about 28 million small businesses in the U.S. These are not the majority. There were just under 36,000 of them. The number is up 33%. 2011, but it's still a small number, so it wasn't that easy to find them. Yeah. And what I found was that they're not really concentrated in any one industry. There were six main categories, but it was more a way of running the business that enabled them to scale their revenues. 
Yes, and I think that's the sort of interesting for me as we kind of talk to services companies and how they go about growing the business. You know, I think that the time factor, like how do you leverage and how do you, you know, factor up your time is one of the key sort of key concepts. You know, how do you systematize? How do you make it repeatable? How do you automate? Have you seen any patterns or looking at the companies that you've profiled, the founders, entrepreneurs that you've spoken to? What do you notice in terms of similarities, in terms of patterns? Are there are there things that you see that they're all doing at some level that allows them to to get to this level of revenue? Absolutely. I have a two-part answer to that, Bruce. Mm-hmm. First, they are somewhat concentrated in industries where it's possible. There's mm-hmm. some industries where just be very, very difficult. The, the main categories were e-commerce, professional services, personal services, like being a nutritionist, informational marketing, manufacturing, mm-hmm. and real estate. Those were all good areas as far as amplifying what one person can do. There were there were many other sort of ran businesses. Yeah. And then there were also very specialized ones like being a hedge fund manager or being yeah. a very successful actor or actress. But those were not as accessible to the average person. So yeah. I didn't focus on those. But once in those categories, what I found was they used three things which are not new at all. Mm-hmm. but really make a difference if you bridge the knowing doing gap and actually do them, mm. which a lot of person <laughs> businesses do not do. One of them is automation. And I just had a panel at We Work Soho West on yeah. Wednesday, and we had five of the entrepreneurs. And that was one thing that really stood out with me was the real emphasis on process and thinking about every single task that's done in business and what can be automated, what's the best way to automate it, what is the best way to update how they're automating it, so that they weren't really spending any of their time on menial tasks. And it, it sounds kind of obvious, but I don't think a lot of people actually do that. You know, we might automate one thing like our schedule app, but we're not looking at our business from a real system level the way you might in a scaled up business. And that puts us at a disadvantage. The other thing is they document what they do. So when they have processes in place, some things cannot be done by a robot or by an app. They have to be done by a person. They figure out the best way to do a blog post or update the website or do a customer service call. They document it often in video, sometimes in writing, so they can hand it off to someone. And it's that every single relationship with a freelancer works out. They have to replace certain freelancers. Yeah. They ultimately have it all set up so that they can hand things off. They also will use source services. So if they're an e-commerce or fulfillment by Amazon, if they're a professional services firm, they might outsource some of their back office, like their invoicing or stuff like that. So they're not sitting there wasting time on it. Um, The other thing I would say is because they do all these things, step away from the business a little bit and they take time to look at it from a higher level instead of just scrambling to meet one deadline after next, which is a real trap. I know for just yeah. doing my own one person, there's always a deadline, but they'll step back and say, okay, let me work on strategy on Fridays and really think about, you know, is this going in the right direction? Do I have the right people on my virtual team? And you know, a lot of things that a real scalable entrepreneur will think about. And what happens with a lot of them, some of them decide, I want to have a lifestyle business. I, I like my lifestyle. Yep. I make a lot of money. I don't need any more money. But I, at least it's a good style business. It's not one where I'm struggling, scrambling. I blow out a tire and my whole life is out of kilter because I can't afford it. Then the other group has the option to scale. And a lot of times they do. So I found on the panel, a few of them that were one-person businesses is now we're in the process of hiring their first employee or had hired one or two since I met them. And what they've done is they've built a really nice ultra lean business that can support that so that the employee, it doesn't mean they're foregoing their paycheck to have yeah. the employee on pay. They have a nice little machine there going so that they can afford it and scale up in the way that Vern wrote about in scaling up. Yeah. It's a really different position than being you know, in a struggling business and trying to hire somebody. And then all of a sudden, it's always a scramble month to month to make payroll. You just don't have the cash flow. You can't keep up. Very different mindset and a different quality of life for the entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of the big idea for me or, or the big concept that I saw and how to apply 
what these entrepreneurs are doing just kind of as a solo entrepreneur getting to this million dollar mark, you know, as we look at companies that, you know, you may be at several million dollars and trying to get to 10 or 20 to 50 is really applying that same thinking, which is rather than, I mean, like on the one hand, we want to be careful that we don't scale problems, right? So let's not take a process that doesn't work and figure out how to put a whole bunch of people into it and just exacerbate my, you know, my business challenges. But actually, let's really hone the process, figure out what is the value in it? What is the best way to do it? How do we define it, improve it, document it, make it so it's highly repeatable before we start bringing in a lot of other resources, other, um, you know, trying to, trying to increase the capacity or scale up the capacity on it. And I, I found, I think the interesting one that I've seen around this is how to actually automate. And the, the whole idea of the video and the documentation is fascinating because I think it's one, one thing that, or sort of a nuance that I, I get from a lot of these folks is there's a difference between sitting down and thinking about how the process should work and sort of typing it out versus actually doing the process and then looking at what actually got done. Do you have, do you have a sense of how, how these folks generally approached the sort of defining a process uh, process <laughs> inside their companies? Were there anything that you saw in terms of how they went about doing that that you thought was unique or different? Well, you, usually they, they started out doing whatever process it was themselves by necessity, because like a lot of one person businesses, there was no one else to do it. And then they would test out different methods. They're, they're big testers of different things. Like when I asked for recommendations for favorite apps, you know, for A-B testing, for instance, they would say, well, when I first started out, I was using this one site and I tried another one and that one was even better. And then I tried a site and that's just how their minds seem to work, where they were always looking for a better way to do it. They wouldn't lock in. They would sort of move along with technology. And I have to say, most of them were not techies at all, but they just, they, they were willing to try things, do the setup. And I, I'm setting up a new CRM right now. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it because you've got to take the little classes, you've got to learn how to do it, certain things don't work right, you realize it didn't work right on this one computer, you've got to switch to your Mac and not your PC. I mean, there's a lot of decisions on a daily basis of like, I'm going to make the time to do this because I need a CRM and I haven't had one for, you know, for X number of years I've, I've been in business. So they are committed to that. And I think that's very, very important, especially as we move into this age of automation. We probably have competitors who are doing these things. So if we're not and we're doing things in these sort of cumbersome ways, they take an extra hour here and there. There's no way you're going to maximize what you can do in a one-person business. You you almost have to. The good news is there's a lot of ways you can outsource that too. Like I found with my CRM, there's this sort of low touch version that comes with signing up. And then there's more of a higher touch version where you can pay people to help you set this up. And that, that could be a really good investment. If you feel like you just won't have the patience to do certain things, it just drives you crazy. Getting them all set up so you can do them really helps. And I, I don't, I, they tended to be more on the do it yourself for end yeah. because they, they sort of like process. But if you're not, I, I think it's definitely possible to still do what they did. Yeah. I think, you know, I'd be curious if, you know, if you, if, if you found and the people you've spoken to, I think one of the things that I notice about people that have done this well is there's a little bit of this balance. Like they're interested in tech and they, they see tech as an advantage, but they're not, they're not enamored by tech that they're not, they don't love tech to the point where they're, they're willing to just get into tech for tech stake and they just, you know, they love tinkering on things. Like they're very practical. Like they know, like, look, I, I know I need a CRM. I know I need some kind of automation tool for email. Like I, I need these things, but they're very kind of practical and very results driven and that they'll, they're, they're willing to say, hey, if this doesn't really work quite right, I'm going to look at other options and see what's really best in the field. And I'm going to test them, but I'm not going to get so enamored by the tech that I'm going to spend hours, you know, tinkering with it. It's this. It's a little bit of a balance because um, I certainly see uh, a lot of the tech folks that I've worked with that end up setting, you know, huge, elaborate automation systems, and in part, I, I always call it resume-driven development. You know, that they're, they're interested in getting into these systems because they want to learn how to use them. You know, to put them on their resume, not because they're really practical at the time. Do you do you notice that, or does that come up for you? And as you talk to these these folks, well, I think for most of them, it was a means to an end. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, sometimes they would make an investment in tech and end up paying off. One entrepreneur in the book, Dan Mezaritsky, it was a um, personal trainer. He was an athlete in Canada and he was injured and he started a business where he initially hired employees 
who were also personal trainers to represent his brand, but he said it, it wasn't working out because he couldn't really afford to pay them a competitive salary. So they were cutting side deals with his customers yeah. and saying, you know, I'll work with you a little bit cheaper on, in my side business. So he got rid of all the employees and he was all ready to close the business. And then he said, well, wait a minute, let me think about how do I align the interests of the trainers with my interests. And he hired the trainers as contractors, built a large army of them, and they, they would pay him a licensing fee into franchise. And he developed this really souped up, C, uh, it's, it's, it's like a CRM. It stores all the clients' workouts in it. It has professional development. He spent like $250,000 on it over X number of years. I, mm -hmm. I forget how long, but he's actually created it into a product that now he has a white label version that other companies license from him. So it became another revenue stream for him. And he's really not a techie. He yeah. hires a developer. I think he's yeah. saying he's pays the developer about a thousand dollars a month as a freelancer to to work on it and constantly upgrade it. But it's become like his not so secret sauce. Yeah. So you you know he. But I see what you're. There are people. It's kind of like with me with writing. Sometimes I get involved in a project project just because I care about it and I spend an inordinate amount of time on it. It's not profitable at all, but it's just something that makes my life fun, but yeah. it's, it's not really serving my business at all. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a trap in some, if you do something you enjoy, it can happen, you know, it, whatever it is. So you have to be mindful of that. I think for the majority of these business owners, it, it, it was, they did have that balance. And a lot of them didn't get into business because they love tech. They, you know, they're a nutritionist or they love real estate or something else, but the tech supported it. Yeah. And they do have a cut, you know, where they, they you know, they're glued to their laptop all the time either. I, I did find that they made time for other things side of the business and, it, it, that's a little counterintuitive in a one-person business. I always feel guilty, like you should, you should be yeah. working constantly. I think because it, when you're one, you're always a little behind. I think. Yeah. I mean, I know I am. You know, I try to get caught up, and then some. You know, there's a client emergency or something like that, and then there goes your perfect schedule. Yeah. You know, so. But they will say, I, you know, I I need the distance. So even if, if I am a little bit behind, I'm going to take the afternoon off and go to the cafe and work on strategy because it's important. Important. Otherwise, I'm just doing this hamster wheel, and it, and it is it's kind of unique to them. I you know I I don't find that many one person businesses really do that because they don't feel they have the luxury. Yeah, honestly, I would say there's a lot of businesses that do do, do that. I mean, this is one of the things yeah. I preach to you know you can be ten million dollars, but if you're not taking if you're not creating structure in your schedule so that you've got dedicated time on a regular basis to think and do strategic work that you're never really going to achieve significant levels of scale. I mean, you'll, you know, may grow at five, 10%, but you're never going to get that 20, 30, 40, 50% growth because you need, you need to step back and look at, okay, where does my focus need to be to really move the needle, to increase value, to improve process? I, I, you know, it seems like there's a couple of mindset things or a couple of ways of thinking or practices, habits that these folks have. I'd like the one of kind of this continuous improvement that I'm always looking at how to, uh, how to improve a process, how to, how to add new technology, how do I improve quality, reduce, you know, errors and things. This idea of strategic thinking, taking a step back, you know, even when things are busy, taking an hour or two and thinking, okay, what do I need to focus on strategically? What else do you see? Any other kind of mindset or habits that these folks uh, tend to tended to do when you look at the group. Well, one that just popped into my head as you were saying that is coaching. Oh, interesting. They are big in coaching, and that's very interesting. I think because usually you see people getting coaches when they've scaled up and they're they're getting to the next level in size in the business. And it's you know I was a small business CEO, now it's a middle market company. I got to expand my skills. They get coaching early. And there were people that had a plateau where they were like in that $500,000 range and they felt like they couldn't figure out on their own how to bust through it. And they went and got a coach. And I remember one of the entrepreneurs saying it was a little bit of a, a challenge to his ego to go to this other person. He actually hired someone in his industry to coach him. Yeah and get him past that mindset. And I think the coaches are really helpful is in getting the entrepreneur out of the mindset that only they can do things a certain way. I mean, that, that's, that's a real issue, I think, for people. I think who care about their work, they can't let go of the reins because they have such high standards. But that's where the system come into place, you know, where if you can really 
reverse engineer what you're doing and tell someone exactly what that was, they can be coached. But sometimes you need a coach to help you do that. Yeah. And the strategy, too, because I, I'm working with a gazelle's coach on my business, and it's very easy to get distracted. You know, you have a lot of opportunity. <laughs> yeah. oh, and then he brings, I, I work with Doug Wick, you know, he brings me to my quarterly goals. I'm, you know, yeah. I always have a list of five. And he's like, well, wait a minute, Elaine, what's the one thing that you can do to move everything forward? Like, one, two, three, four, five, six. And he, he keeps bringing, you know, he'll keep bringing me back. And I, I, I think we tend to, you know, we, we sometimes you don't know where opportunities will lead. And that's part of the challenge. It's like you have five things on the table. You're kind of moving forward on all of them. And then when one of them picks up traction. You're going to focus more on that one. Mm -hmm. It's a little harder to step back and say, even if that one didn't pick up traction as quickly as the other ones, I'm not just going to let the external forces drive me. I'm going to have more of a strategy and commit to this yeah. and make it happen even if that one is harder if if i've decided it's the most important thing for the business that's where the, i think the coaches are so valuable because it's kind of like being a journalist right i've, I've been mm -hmm. with so many thousand entrepreneurs over the years it would be hard for someone to describe a scenario to me that i haven't heard before you know what i mean it, mm -hmm. it has its unique flavor of their life but you know, running out of money or something like, you know, how many times I've heard that story, yeah. you know, this is a thousand varieties of it. And then what happened? Oh, well, you got divorced where your employees left you or your business collapsed or whatever. You know, I've heard it before and I might be able to think of ways that it could, the story could have ended differently. That's, that's the value of a coach because they work with other people. They've heard the stories before. They've seen many different solutions. They have their own solutions. And if they have sort of a system that they can teach you to help you logically think through things, mm -hmm. then that really gives you a great competitive advantage, I, especially for creative people, I think, because I'm, you know, I would say, you know, there are some people that are, you know, they, they tend to be carried away with their creative ideas. It's very hard to rein yourself yeah. in and be very systematic and logical and say, okay, what are the steps to executing on this? Or what even is the vision in the first place? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I think that's it. Uh, there's, there's a, there's a process, there's a cycle, there's a series of patterns. And I think, I mean, I, you know, as a coach, I think one of the main things we do is help, help see patterns in businesses, in situations, in entrepreneurs, and having having seen things play out again and again and in, in, in slightly different ways, but we can abstract it to a level of, oh, okay, so it's one of these situations and here are positive ways it can, in, uh, positive outcomes it can have, here are negative outcomes it can have. How do we create more awareness of what's going on so we can create more opportunities for positive outcomes? Um, I, I like to say, you know, as a coach, we're, we're flashlights, not hammers, right? We, we, we're there to kind of illuminate things and, and create focus around things, not necessarily to do the work. And I think that's, you know, I think that's the, the idea of an early stage company, a solo entrepreneur actually engaging in coach. It, it, it's actually really critical at that stage because you have no, you have no perspective. You are the business. You have no one in it to actually play, play the role of giving perspective or diversity of opinion in it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised, man. I, I, as a coach, I use a coach. So I, get, I, get the, I get the model. I don't, they think of it as a luxury, though, and I did, too, until I started using it. But I, what I saw was, you know, there's more than just the coaching sessions. There's sort of an unconscious process that gets unleashed where when you have someone challenging you, and forcing you out of your comfortable ways of thinking. All of a sudden, you're, you know, you're at cycling class or yoga or whatever you do, and an idea will come to you about how to move forward on something when you weren't really even thinking about it. But if no one had planted those seeds in your mind, just be going along doing work that had no real method to the madness. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think there's just something kind of mysterious about the process. Like with any teacher that kicks in that you can't predict and that makes you grow as a person as, as and as an entrepreneur. I also think, I, I don't know what your coaching style is like because I haven't worked with you, Bruce, but mm -hmm. what I found is with my coach, I can talk about other issues that impact the business. Like I'm a mother with four children. I have a very, very busy life. I do have a full-time business. And sometimes that impacts my business. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I might have a seat balance where there's a lot of demands on me with my kids and working on the strategic goals. And I can talk about that 
that and like, okay, what are the ways around those things where, you know, I still need to get these things done in my business, but I just have a lot of demands on my time. You know, how, you know that that's useful too because yeah. they can give you yeah. some creative strategies you might not have thought of before. I think that's very true. I mean, I, I would say, you know, I generally work with leadership teams, so I'm dealing with kind of the team dynamics. And and one thing I say is, you know, leadership teams are are people. They're made up of people, you know, and people are complicated and people have lots of things going on. And so, you know, my, my general kind of ground rule or my kind of the way I approach it is, you know, we're going to talk about anything that's impacting the business, right? So if someone's got something going on in their personal life that's impacting the way they're showing up in the business, then we need to talk about it. You know, I'm not there to be a therapist and I'm not there to deal with professional psychological diagnoses and things. But, you know, to the extent that someone has, you know, a, a personal situation that's impacting their ability to show up, how they're showing up, that's something we should know about and something we should accommodate with, you know, and support them and help them with. So I think that it's, I think that's generally, I would say most coaches have that view because I think as coaches, we're always looking at overall performance and we have to deal with the whole person. You know, I, I would say as you shift more to the consulting side, you're dealing more with the people that are just focused on the kind of the pure business side of it. But it's a good point. And I think as a any entrepreneur or any senior exec in these teams needs to kind of figure out not only for themselves, but for the people they're working with, you know, how what's going on and how do I get curious and how do I support them around that? That's interesting. Yeah, on the team, I would imagine it's, it's important too because more companies are saying your whole self to work and they are more concerned about life. So I think, I think what we see also is – I see a lot, especially young men want to be very involved with their families in a way, you know, that generationally I think was not supported. Like yeah. my father's generation, you know, it was like the man was the breadwinner. Now it's, it's, it's very much family by family. And I see when I talk to young men, a lot of times they're feeling challenges with work and life balance. Yeah. And so, you know, it's sort of a new frontier and it's something where, I, I, you know, it's good. It's good to have a sounding board as to some creative solutions yeah. that also work within the business. Because ultimately, they may like you, but they also need you to perform and do the job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and as an entrepreneur, and it's, it's, one, one of the reasons I really love services businesses and just kind of the whole service sector is that because you are dealing fundamentally, you're dealing with people. You know, and you know, incredibly powerful, incredibly capable. You know, but also incredibly complicated at times. And so. You know, I think on one hand, you know, we want to be thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we focus? How do we streamline? How do we make processes around it? But a lot of it is how do we build good cultures, right? How do we create engaging cultures inside the company that are going to allow me to, you know, find the talent, retain the talent that is really going to help me grow, uh, grow the business. And it's about understanding who the people are and what do they have got going on and how do I become a positive force in their lives that, uh, you know, creates that engagement for them. Because even in a one-person business, culture is important because the freelancers are voluntary, right? You know, it's like it's, I take out a It's I'm almost a more important. You know? The project with <laughs> yeah. if you're not nice to me and, you, you know, when you do something, you know, it takes you six months to pay me or whatever, I might make the decision that it wasn't really worth it. So if you, you know, if you're not, if you're not thinking about culture, even in a one-person business, the culture that you project to the people that support you or your vendors, then your business won't grow either. So I think, you know, that's where even with the coaching, sometimes people don't realize that they just think they're in a vacuum, but you're really not. Yeah. Well, and they think it's very transactional and they think just because I pay somebody or I have a pay an invoice or I've got an invoice, like that, that, that's going to be everything that decides who works with me and who doesn't. And I think you're right. I think it's culture actually becomes more important when you're, you're dealing with kind of a freelance or gig or, you know, a contractor economy or, or a system. So, so we're, we're actually hitting time here, but um, uh, if people want to find out more information on the book about uh, your writing, about the work that you do, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you and, and contact you? They, they can find me at the million dollar in person business.com. It's spelled out in words, numbers in that. And I have a contact me box there. So I welcome them to write to me, get in touch. I really enjoy hear from entrepreneurs. So please tell me your story. I write a lot of different meetings. I always, I love hearing people's stories and you don't have to be a million dollar one person business. I cover scalable businesses and I cover businesses that are one person that haven't got to a million. So um, please get in touch. Awesome. And I'll make sure that those links uh, are on the show notes and for the podcast. I mean, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time and I'll look forward to keeping in touch and, and excited to see what else you write about soon. Thank you so much, Bruce. This was fun. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. 
To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com newsletter.